Well, good afternoon. We are once again re-recording a, uh, actually recording a session that uh, did not record as we had it in Sunday school. And um, the, uh, uh, the, the problem was we had no internet when we got started on Sunday. So we're going to uh, catch up with this uh, recording. And again, it doesn't have the discussion, which was very good. And I will try to bring that to the forefront as we uh, do the questions at the end of the video. So now we're going to um, look at David, um, an interesting, interesting person uh, that uh, was a man after God's own heart, but certainly uh, was a sinful man as well. So we're, that's what we're going to be seeing today. David's life is narrated as pivotal in the history of salvation. David's name occurs nearly 800 times in the Old Testament and another 60 times in the New. David's name is taken up a thousand years later as a title for Jesus, son of David. Name, his name is honored and revered still. Christians and Jews commonly name their children David. No other name from the extensive list of Hebrew kings has anywhere near the providen, uh, prominence of David. In fact, no other life in the biblical record, with the exception of Jesus, is given such extensive and detailed attention. The effect of this sustained narrative treatment is to immerse us in the human condition. This is what is involved in being a human being, created and called, judged and saved by God. All the complexity of glory and difficulty involved in our human condition. And that's a quote from Eugene Peterson. So here we go, uh, R.C. Sproul talking about David. I'll never forget the first opportunity I had to visit the Holy Land. People had been after me for years to go on that trip saying that I would greatly profit from it and enjoy it. And I said, oh, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. I finally went. I'll never forget it. We stayed in a hotel on the Mount of Olives overlooking the Valley of Kidron, staring right across that to the old city of Jerusalem. And I remember one night coming out onto the patio behind the hotel and just standing there late at night looking at the walls as they were illumined by floodlights and then to the left of the remaining walls of Jerusalem that small parcel of land that was the old city, the city where David first established the capital. And there in the shadows in the darkness I, I just closed my eyes and I imagined David fleeing from his palace with his family because of the advance of the rebel horde that was marching against him under the leadership of his own son Absalom. And the Bible tells us that on that night that David fled, he went down into the, into the, the valley of Kidron wailing as he went. And as I stood there at that place and imagined David, I was overcome by uh, just a unique sensation of history, because it's been slightly over 3,000 years since David was anointed king of Israel. I remember another occasion, several years later, where <clears throat> somebody said to me, R.C., when you go to heaven, apart from your predeceased relatives and loved ones, who are the five people that you would most want to see in heaven from church history? And I, I can't remember right now which five I enumerated on that occasion, but I know one of those five was David. I just can't get over David. If there ever was a Renaissance man before the Renaissance, it was David. Herbert Marcuse, the uh, philosopher of revolution of the 20th century, his most famous book was entitled One Dimensional Man. If ever a title did not apply to David, it was that, because here was a man who was multifaceted, extremely complex, 
he was a, a wild bundle of contradictions that he proved the adage of those who say that when he was good, he was very, very good, and when he was bad, he was terrible. <laughs> so we see the greatness of humanity manifested in this man's life as well as the depths of corruption. And that's one of the reasons, I guess, that I like David, because he is so real. I remember Kierkegaard once made the observation, my complaint is not that my age is wicked, but that it's paltry, that it lacks passion. And he said, whenever I get depressed, he said, I turn to the pages of the Old Testament, because when I read the Bible there, he said, I find people who lie and kill and cheat and steal and commit adultery. He said, in a word, they are people of like passion with us, not paper saints or cardboard heroes. And such was a man like David. Now, we've left off the last time beginning about the onset of the monarchy with the first kings being Saul. And we saw that how Saul began in a meteoric rise of splendor and very shortly degenerated into rank corruption of all sorts, where he not only was overcome by madness and jealousy and rage against David, but he res resorted to consultation with uh, sorcerers, visiting the witch of Endor, and so on. And so Saul, who had been so distinct, distinguished as a warrior, finally was killed in battle. And we read the report of that in the first chapter of 2 Samuel. And we read of the message that is brought to David that this man who had sought to kill him again and again had been smitten in battle. And we read these words in verse 17 of chapter 1 of 2 Samuel, Then David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over... Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. The beauty of Israel is slain on your high places. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath, proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. O mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, nor rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for the shield of the mighty is cast away there, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, and the sword of Saul did not return empty. Saul and Jonathan were beloved and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Oh, how the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war have perished. This, from a man who had been pursued relentlessly, uh, who had tried to kill him, even then, David, who had had more than one opportunity to kill Saul and refused to put his hand upon him because Saul was the king and Saul was the Lord's anointed. Now David writes a lamentation over the death of the king. Well, as I said, the story of David is a story replete with contradictions, complexities. David was many things. First of all, he was a child prodigy. I'm always fascinated by the stories of the great musicians like Mozart and others who at a very early age uh, achieved such remarkable levels of accomplishment in their field and in their art. But David was but a boy who had taken care of his father's sheep in the fields and defended them from the lion and from the bear. When we see him introduced in the scene where the people of Israel 
have been cowled by the champion of the Philistines, Goliath. And the armies of Israel were encamped on one side of a ravine and the armies of, of the Philistines on the other. And every day for week after week after week, the champion of the Philistines came into the valley and this giant Goliath challenged the armies of Israel to send out a champion that they could settle their conflict in man-to-man -man combat. And no one was found in all of the armies of Israel who would take up the challenge. And the king sat in his tent and trembled until Jesse sends his young son David to the encampment to bring some food for his older brothers to make sure they're nourished. And this boy comes and he sees the sight of this giant daring Israel to come forward with a champion to fight him. And he's, in his youthful idealism, is completely befuddled by this. You know, he's looking around. Well, where were his brothers? Where's the king? Why doesn't somebody go out of him? What are soldiers supposed to do but fight for the honor and the defense of their people? And David, he can't stand that this Philistine is not only shaming the people of Israel, but he dares do it with the arrogance of making mockery of the God of Israel. And he comes to the king and he said, let me go. King said, you're a boy. I can't let you go. He said, why? He said, I can handle this giant. He said, God has delivered me from the lion. He's delivered me from the bear. Let me go into battle. And finally, since no one else would take up the challenge, and Saul was sick to heart of listening to these jibes day after day and week after week, he finally called his armor bearer and put all of his enormous armor on David. And David couldn't even move in this armor. He said, take this stuff off. I can't wear this. I don't need any armor. I'll take my sling and my five smooth stones. And the Lord God of hosts will deliver this man into my hand. And David walked into the valley of death alone as a boy. Not a, a boy against a man, but a boy against a giant. And when, when Goliath saw this boy coming, he was infuriated. I mean, he was insulted. He said, what is this? You send a dog? He said, I come in the name of the Lord God of Israel. With the sling. And the stone struck the giant in the temple, and the giant fell over dead and even at that moment, David races over and takes the sword of Goliath and cuts off his head and holds up the head of Goliath. This is the stuff of fairy tales. But this is recorded for us here in Scripture as sober history. No wonder this young boy became an instant hero to the people of Israel. This was just the beginning of David's military exploits. We could argue over who was the greatest warrior in the history of the Old Testament. Some might vote for Joshua. But certainly in terms of military legends and exploits, no one ever exceeded David. He was the the General Patton, the Stonewall Jackson, the Hannibal, the uh, Alexander the Great all rolled into one as a warrior in his day. In fact, if anything, the picture of the early days of David show us a man who at times becomes almost barbarian. At times he doesn't seem so much like a, a respected general like Julius Caesar. He seems more like Attila the Hun like a barbarian when he gets in this roving band of marauders back down near the Dead Sea and in Ziklag and, and, and his, his fighting. He's like a Robin Hood. He himself is a fugitive from the wrath of Saul, and he gets a, a, a bunch of ragtag soldiers around him, 
and he becomes a marauding, raiding gorilla of the day. Bloodthirsty, cruel, vicious. And you look at that, that portion of David's life and you wonder how the Bible could ever say that this was a man after God's own heart. And yet, in addition to being this warrior and this bandit, we find that the man was extremely sensitive, that he had the spirit and the heart of a poet and a musician. David would have to be the poet laureate of Israel. And the fruit of his literary <clears throat> production comes down to us in the Psalms. There is no literature in all of sacred scripture that reveals a deeper sensitivity that gives us a brighter window to the soul of a godly man who pants after God like a deer pants after water brooks than we find in the poems of David. And not only did he have this literary gift of creativity, but he distinguishes himself as a musician. In fact, he is so competent as a musician that this is the one place where he was welcomed into the palace by the deranged King Saul. Because when Saul would go into his fits of depression and his <coughs> melancholia and madness, he would send for David, and David would come and play on his lyre. And as he played, the music was so beautiful that it softened that raging demon within Saul. And so David composed pieces for, uh, for the music of the religious life of the day. But in addition to being a prodigy, a warrior, a bandit, a poet, and a musician, David perhaps is most remembered for being the king. Indeed, the supreme symbol of kingship in the Old Testament. And what a king he was. Even though his ascendancy to the throne was through a circuitous route and, and there was fierce resistance among the people who followed after Saul and sought to make Saul's kingship a dynasty through biological inheritance. Nevertheless, God had spoken through the work of the anointing of Samuel that Samuel had anointed David king so that David was God's choice to be the king of Israel. And finally, when he was able to put down the civil war and bring the people into unity, his monarchy began to prosper. I remember when I was in graduate school in the Netherlands in the 60s and living just outside of Amsterdam and going to school in the city there, how the Dutch people loved to speak about the 17th century. I mean, they seemed like they never stopped talking about the 17th century. And they had all the tourist guides to the home of Rembrandt. And they would tell the stories of the magnificent output of art that came out of that tiny country. For in a brief period of time in the 17th century, this tiny little country that was always threatened to be buried by the sea ruled the world in commerce and in maritime uh, strength. And so the Dutch referred to that period as their golden age. Well, there was a golden age to Greece, a golden age to Rome, a golden age to the Netherlands, but there was also a golden age to this tiny little nation that was a ribbon of real estate linking the three continents there in the Middle East. The golden age of Israel was during the Davidic monarchy. For David, when he came to power, conquered all of the nations around Israel that threatened their security. He extended the boundaries for the first time from Dan to Beersheba. He instituted the greatest period of prosperity in their history. And he was not only a strong king 
and a benevolent king, but he was an extremely able administrator, which is so unusual when you have these poetic, charismatic uh, champions. He was a master diplomat. In fact, it was a stroke of genius to take this newly conquered town that had belonged to the Jebusites, that after he conquered it, instead of moving his, his uh, capital to the north or to the south to satisfy the rivaling parties, uh, the Yankees and the Confederates of Israel, he decided to situate his capital in a brand new place. And he established the headquarters for his government, the seat of the monarchy in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the city of peace, he named it. It had been called the city of bread. And now this city becomes the symbol of the presence of God. It's in this city that the temple will be established. It's in this city that the Redeemer will come and be crucified. This is Mount Zion. This is the city that the Jews still say all the time next year in Jerusalem. This is the city that is the most hotly disputed piece of real estate in the world today. And it rose in such prominence under the monarchy of David. I mean, he would be famous in secular history for his accomplishments as a king in the ancient world, even if he were not so prominent in Scripture. But I think maybe the thing we remember most about David was his extraordinary exploit as a sinner. Whatever David did, he did in a big way. <laughs> he, didn't, uh, he didn't fool around when he became involved with this woman, Bathsheba, head over heels in love, blinded by his lust, stooping now not only to adultery, but goes out of his way to use his power as the king to place one of his faithful soldiers in the front lines to make sure that he is exposed to enemy fire and is killed. That's what he does with the husband of Bathsheba. And he takes Bathsheba to himself and impregnates her. And God sent to David the prophet Nathan. And Nathan told the unforgettable parable. He said to David, he said, there was a man who in the kingdom was loyal to the king. He was poor, destitute, but he had one little sheep, one little sheep, a lamb that was a female lamb, and he loved this sheep. He allowed the sheep to live in his house, to eat from his table. His life was poured into this one little lamb. And there was another farmer in the land who had huge flocks of sheep, and he saw the beauty of this one little lamb that was owned by the poor man. And in his arrogance, he came in and he stole that little lamb from the poor man. And David heard that story and he said, not in my kingdom. You find out who that fellow is, he said, and I will bring the wrath of my administration down upon him and justice will be served, at which point Nathan gave the immortal statement, thou art the man. You see, David's fall was more violent than the fall of Goliath because his was a spiritual fall. In many ways, it seemed like he was going to just repeat the degeneration and corruption that had manifested the reign of his predecessor, Saul. But the great difference between Saul and David is found in the repentance of David. David becomes, in the Old Testament, the supreme model of godly awakening to one's own spiritual and moral bankruptcy and the utter necessity of relying upon God's grace and nothing else for salvation. 
And on this occasion, the depths of David's repentance is made manifest in Psalm 51. Every student of the Old Testament should read Psalm 51 very carefully to get a flavor of what it really means to lay oneself bare before a holy and righteous God and to rely on His mercy and on His mercy alone. And so in that sense, David was a man after God's own heart. Well, uh, R.C. certainly lays out quite a, a history of David and uh, basically says he thinks David's a really important person and he would have liked to have met him. Um, maybe so. Uh, it would be good to learn how somebody goes from the depths of the depravity that David was involved in to be a man after God's own heart. How did that happen? How did that work? Very interesting to say the least. How does David anticipate Christ's teaching that we are to love our enemies? David would not kill Saul. Saul's after him. Saul wants to kill him. He hates David. And yet David anticipates Christ's teaching in loving his, our enemies in the sense that David would not kill Saul. He wouldn't take Saul's life because Saul was the king. Saul was the person that ruled over the kingdom and David would not take his life. That's what Jesus taught that we are to love our enemies. He loved Saul for being the king. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, what is David most concerned to promote in his battle against Goliath? The interesting thing about this is that uh, in my capacity working with young people with Fellowship of Christian Athletes, um, this is often the story that is used when uh, uh, people are giving a, a chapel talk, David and Goliath, and it's sort of couched in the, in, the, in the idea that when you go out there, no matter how big that guy is that you're facing, you can beat him. Look what David did to Goliath. The truth of what this is about is that Goliath was actually blaspheming God, and David wanted to protect God. David wanted to, to vindicate God, and that's why he was going to do battle against Goliath. David couldn't understand why other people didn't embrace that, why other people didn't stand up and say, we've got to stand up for Yahweh. What qualities does he display that indicate he will be a fit king for Israel? Well, David was a good leader, he was a, a tactician in, in, in war. He was able to uh, uh, do things that, that just made people want to follow him. So he, would, he, he had those qualities. According to Dr. Sproul, David is like which English literary character? It's like Robin Hood. Now, you know, we were kind of befuddled in the class about this and after hearing Dr. Sproul today, um, I, I've, I sort of figured out what he meant. And that's the fact that Robin Hood did a lot of good things, but he was an outlaw. He, was, uh, he, he gathered a group of people around him that were not, were not the best of character, were, were kind of, uh, uh, a, it was sort of like a gang he had around him. And they went around and they, they, they did things that uh, probably were unlawful. And yet Robin Hood, in, uh, in his taking from the rich and giving to the poor, did exactly that. He was a thief. David was somebody that, that uh, uh, went to battle, and, uh, but pretty much on his own. Okay, let's fill in these blanks. Although David was a great and mighty warrior, he also had the heart of a poet and a musician 
as seen as in his composition of song and verse. David was also a man after God's own heart. Now, uh, what did uh, Dr. Sproul give as proving David was the supreme symbol of kingship in the Old Testament? Well, he won a brutal civil war against the supporter of Saul's family. Um, so he was a military leader. The golden age of Israel was during the Davidic monarchy. Israel was prosperous during this time. David conquered the surrounding nations and began a great period of pros prosperity in Israel. He was a very capable administrator and a skillful diplomat. So he was able to bring people apparently to the table and, and deal, with, deal with things. And he established his capital at Jerusalem, the city of peace, Jerusalem. Who is the most well-known prophet who prophesied, prophesied during the days of David? It was Nathan. When Nathan told his parable, David quickly pointed out the sin of another person before he noticed his own. Are we prone to take more notice of the sins of others than we are of our own? And everybody in the class on Sunday agreed that we are. We always want to look and say, oh, that person's doing, doing this. Look what they're doing. Not nearly, not nearly, uh, I'm not nearly as bad as that person. Look what they're doing. How can we be sure to first take the log out of our own eye before we take the speck out of the eye of another person? Well, we have to understand that we are sinful and that we need to deal with any sins that we have before we go and try to talk to somebody else about their sins. Um, and Psalm 51 um, is a great psalm. If you uh, take a moment, take, a, take five minutes to read through it now and um, just look of how you can use it in your own life. Thank you. And uh, the next session is Solomon and the Temple. Thanks for watching. And you can subscribe to this and uh, be able to get these, uh, get, get the uh, uh, videos of our classes. And there's always, there might be something else pop up along the way. So thank you again and have a good day.